What is going on? Welcome to ednews.com. It's your host, EJ Carrion. Today, our guest is Ernest Azuego, Higher Ed and Workforce po Policy Director at Young Invincibles. Ernest, how you doing? Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm really good. Uh, thank you for having me. Always great to chat. Uh, yeah, happy to be on Ed News. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I know I, I, I got connected with you again just for just seeing a great post you had on LinkedIn around uh, the public service loan forgiveness program. And, and I just I was like, man, let's get Ernest on here because this is such an important time with 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 February being uh, an important date for everyone as well who has to repay their loans. And but before we get started, I know this is not just work for you. I know this is something that's a part of your life. Um, and so tell me why you passionately care about this for yourself and for, you know, Americans across the country. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my mantra for this work has always been, yeah, I want to see American higher education and American education broadly uh, be what um, it was promised, you know, be what it, my mom was promised it could be right as a critical part of this idea as, you know, America land of opportunity, uh, right? My mom um, immigrated to the United States in the 80s to better her lot in life and, and honestly, like, provide opportunity for her kids as well, me being one of them, of course. Um, you know, she worked um, several, several years um, at jobs like Walmart, Nordstrom, et cetera, et cetera, to make ends meet. Um, and when it was time for my siblings and I to begin to go to college, uh, she also returned to college. So and mm. she was a student parent. She was trying to provide for us. Um, she worked full time um, while going to school full time. Um, and, you know, I think that both of our journeys kind of have had a significant impact on the way I think about higher ed policy. Um, you know, as we were kind of, as we've we chatted about before and as we were chatting about earlier, um, people pursue higher education. It's not for the same reasons of not many people are pursuing college strictly as a I'm trying to become a better citizen uh, model, right? People pursue higher education, education after high school in this country um, to better their financial lot, to pursue economic mobility and financial stability. Um, you know, we know that um, in times of economic volatility, in the Great Recession, and even this latest recession uh, prompted by the pandemic. Um, it's people with college credentials and particularly bachelor's degrees and above um, who secure the jobs. You know, we know that, um, you know, statistics say that by 2025, just four years from now, 60% of all jobs will require some form of education after high school, post-secondary credential, right? So people pursue higher education to better their lot in life. Um, that was the case for my mom and that was the case for me. Um, you know, my mom's case. Uh, she went to a small for profit school in Dallas um, that honestly deceived her about the power of her credential. Um, she went to do nursing. And when she exited and earned that credential um, after, you know, years paying loans, again, working full time, um, really trying to push to make ends meet, um, the jobs that she wanted to apply for, the jobs that she pursued that credential for would not accept her. Um, she ended up taking jobs that were known for being abusive to their employees. Um, and, you know, that's something that weighed very heavily on the spirit, uh, what she could do with that credential. Um, and it weighed on mine as well. Uh, you know, me, um, my story is, uh, is different. You know, I went to the University of Oklahoma uh, for all intents and purposes, a great school. Um, but I had uh, an impossible decision to make when I found out that my mom um, got sick. Uh, it was stay in school and try to like, you know, I was working every semester. I was working both on campus and off campus, which you're really not supposed to do, but lots of students do it. Um, and, you know, I could either put all that money towards like helping out at home or I could, what I felt like was a selfish decision, try to keep push through, you know, push through school. Um, I obviously chose the former, right? Uh, and in the time since, you know, and the time since stopping out of school, I have been very lucky. People who come from where I come from, who have the experiences that I've had up and through college, do not get the opportunities that I've had. I work in DC now. Uh, I work in policy development. I'm literally working to make sure that higher education supports students who are like me. Um, 
But the reality for many people, especially people who stop out of school, um, but incur debt in an attempt to finish is much more stark. Um, and so, yeah, this work, you know, is my work, but it is also deeply personal. Uh, people pursue higher education to better their lot in life. And when policies that come from the federal government and state government that come from people who have uh, very traditional standard uh, experiences at the top 100 higher education institutions, um, leave out critical student groups, um, perpetuate uh, the same issues that hold back marginalized student groups from being successful in college. Um, that's absolutely personal. Uh, it has disparate impact, and and that's what that's why I engage in the work. I'm trying to fix that cycle, and you know, work with folks to correct the course of American higher education. Yeah, no, that's 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 powerful, man. And I think it's 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 I think so important to have someone who who I feel like has such a connective tissue from. Your, your, your mom's education, your own education and, uh, being, being first gen and kind of going through that space. I just think, I mean, I, I think of me and my wife, you know, first generation kids and the passions around our day. I, I just, your story to me just connects with so many of us in some way. And I think that is, um, so awesome to have someone like you caring about this and, and being in DC working on this. Um, what I want to know is I know it's been nearly two years since we've had to pay uh, on our student loans and that, you know, two years is a long time to, you know, cool. come, come back from a habit and, uh, that's February 1st, but, uh, and I know October 31st is important as well. So I would love for you to hit, uh, the important two dates that are coming up and why are those dates important? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so I can start with October 31st. Um, the October 31st date is largely related to public service loan forgiveness. So it's a program um, that came into existence, you know, Congress passed a bill in 2007, excuse me, that brought this program into existence towards the end of the Bush administration. Um, and the promise of the public service loan forgiveness program was pretty simple. It said, if you work in a job that serves the public, um, which they very broadly at the time defined as you know, working for a nonprofit, uh, working for government at any, at any, at any level, sorry, and working for um, professions, again, that kind of are public facing, being teachers, firefighters, police officers, that's kind of the mantra around that, right? If you work a job in the public service uh, for 10 years, you could have the rest of your student and, and make qualifying payments through that time, 120 payments, um, a payment a month, 10 years, 120 payments, you could have your loans, the rest of your balance forgiven. That was the promise of the program, right? But it's implementation, um, was interesting and unique, and its details uh, in the plan were uh, definitely construed a certain way to help essentially with cost savings of the plan. Um, in the subsequent years, so that was in, in, in 2007, right? Which meant that 2017 was the first year that people who had worked in public service for 10 years would be able to have their um, loans forgiven. The first um, cohort of public service loan uh, forgiveness uh, program participants would have their loans forgiven. Um, and this is th this was an important time, right? Because again, this was like fascinating kind of landmark policy making from government, from Congress and the Department of Education at the time. Um, people basically based their careers, right? On this law's passing and on what it could promise for them. Because um, we know that student loans are critical and they can be really burdensome for some folks, especially folks who do the kind of jobs that are in the public service and don't pay as much as like the private sector, corporate America, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, people based their careers on this, um, really pursued it. Uh, and in 2017, really 2018, uh, we began to see major, major issues with the problem or, or with the program, right? Um, the Department of Education did a study in 2018 and found that just 1% of all of the, at the time, 29,000 applicants who had applied received loan forgiveness. Mm. Um, that was a 99% rejection rate on wow. the bounds of not fitting, you know, the qualifying payment scheme or the um, qualified employers uh, portion of the program. Um, a number of reasons folks were rejected. Um, and then the Government Accountability Office um, kind of took that data, did a, a report after that, and found that people were confused about the specifics of the program. And when some of the specifics began to come to light, um, again, it was very clear, right, that there was an issue in implementation 
um, for which, you know, don't like to talk about blame too much in policy, but like there was plenty of it to spread, right? Um, part of it was on the part of loan servicers. One critical loan servicer, Fed Loan um, Servicing, was in charge basically of all the loans, was put in charge of all the loans that qualified for public service loan forgiveness. Um, there were errors in servicing um, kind of that ran the gauntlet. Uh, for example, just, you know, as a few examples of many, right? Um, to qualify, one of the critical piece of public service loan forgiveness is qualifying payments, um, which means basically you have to be in an income driven repayment plan and be making payments that kind of meet the threshold of that plan. Um, and you have to make 120 of those over the course of 10 years, right? Uh, the, or well, 120 just broadly, um, you can take some breaks in between. But part of the issue of that was, you know, uh, servicers were um, calculating wrong on some parts. So people would pay just a cent or two off, sometimes dollars off, and those payments wouldn't count. Mm. Imagine thinking for nine, 10 years, right? That you've been making qualifying payments um, and the balance was off every month, which meant that none of those payments count. And you, again, put your career on this, right? Um, there were other issues related to the department. You know, as much as servicers um, kind of didn't know parts of the, the program and didn't know how to help uh, people certify their employers and their loans for some of it, um, all servicers could only really do what the Department of Education directed them to do, right? Um, the Department of Education, federal, uh, uh, federal, the Federal Student Aid Office, right, is technically the the guarantor of all 40 million loans in the student loan portfolio um they pay the servicers to do all the kind of customer service related to it ultimately ed had some blame in this too um and the trump administration at the time was not fully taking seriously what it meant to begin to see the first things of forgiveness in this program right so we had these huge issues that kind of ran the gauntlet um again there's only a few examples um and the critical part, to go back to your question about the October 31st piece, is that recently uh, the Biden administration, Department of Education, came out with a number of fixes to the public service loan forgiveness program um, or proposed fixes. Um, the most critical piece of them being uh, this idea of going back and looking at um, certain borrowers' uh, payments and the intent to pay in a time um, and basically like raising the number of qualifying payments uh, based on errors that, you know, that the basically individuals had no control over. Mm. Um, so this October 31st date is really critical. Um, it's the date by which the department says like, please, you know, certify your education, um, or sorry, certify your employers, make sure they're certified as, as you know, certified employers, um, submit an application again for public service loan forgiveness. Um, so that the department knows how, uh, who to target, right, to give those loans. <clears throat> so it's a critical piece, but um, it's also important that, to mention that public service loan forgiveness um, and people who qualify for it even make up a pretty small amount of the broad student loan portfolio, which brings us to that February 1st date, right? Um, just as you mentioned, after what will be nearly two years of not making payments, monthly payments on student loans, um, the Department of Education fully intends um, to begin repayment. Um, um, and, and to kind of start those processes over again on February 1st, 2022. This is significant in a number of different contexts, right? Um, one, anytime, um, you know, we find in, fe in federal policy in particular, you put uh, a pause on some level of payment and stuff like this, the process of starting it back up is always pretty complicated. Um, this is just multiple fold, right, for the Department of Education. Uh, where federal student aid is already understaffed um, and, and trying to fill those slots quickly, but they're already understaffed, um, already dealing with the, uh, this rule um, that they've put up on public service loan forgiveness and a number of other critical pressing issues. Uh, you also have the fact that now several um, servicers, loan servicers, have decided to end their contracts with the Department of Education uh, starting at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, among them are Fed, Fed Loan Servicing, you may remember, as I mentioned, they are in charge of a lot of the programs that basically like lead to forgiveness, including uh, public service loan forgiveness. Um, Navient, uh, which truthfully has kind of been um, targeted as a bad actor among servicers, uh, also recently announced that it wasn't going to renew its contract. Um, you know, these two uh, servicers alone represent 
millions of borrowers in the student loan portfolio, right? So you have this, this period of time right now where there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how loans at both of those um, servicers and a couple other servicers you've mentioned that they won't renew will be transferred to new servicers, right? A process that has historically been very chaotic um, every time it's yeah. happened and it's taken a long time to source out. Um, then you have this a quickly approaching date of February 1st that the department seems committed to, it doesn't seem like they'll move on um, for restarting payments. Um, and these things kind of will collide in a way um, that we hope, right? We can only hope will be, won't be too tra traumatic for borrowers, um, but all signs, right? Point to there being a lot of complications. Um, what we're, we're almost to November, right? So November, December, January, February, that's a short period of time for the department um, who's began to do began to do this uh, to kind of communicate a lot yeah. to again a, a millions of borrowers. I want to make. Including, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've been talking for a while. No, no. Yeah, I was. I was. I was um, so I want to make sure, like, what what you're saying here is that not only are there people who are going to have to get back to the habit of of of, of paying loans, how yeah. and who they paid is unknown for millions of people because of people who didn't confirm uh, their agreement uh, with the department. Right. And so news is coming out now about who um, will be servicing some of the loans. We know, for example, um, that borrowers who currently are serviced by Navient uh, will be moving to a company called Maximus. Um, Maximus, of course, has its own um, set of kind of complications mm -hmm. around the student loan portfolio. Um, a lot of advocates would, you know, say that they're really watching this transfer closely uh, for that reason. But you're absolutely right. Um, and it's important to think about this, right, from that personal context. Um, you, know, a little, you know, a lot of people I'm sure who are watching this will, you know, make, might have student loans. Um, but for those who don't, uh, try to imagine, you know, this world where you're trying to meet um, the quality, you tr you're trying to make payments according to one of 12 um, I think I think 12, maybe even more uh, different loan repayment plans to the department already, right? Um, so there are a number of plans, income driven repayment, there's like basic repayment, that is already in and of itself a pretty confusing process, um, especially if you're trying to, again, qualify for a program like public service loan forgiveness, where you have to be on a specific one, you have to be paying a specific amount per month. So there's that piece. Um, then you get a break from that because of the pandemic for nearly two years, right? And in that time, it becomes clear that you're, you know, you, you know, a lot of people have received these emails already from their servicer saying, "Hey, look, you know, happy for you that you'll be able to do this and pay these loans again. Uh, we're not going to be there. Uh, <laughs> that's not going to be with <laughs> us." Um, so you had definitely have this scenario right now where um, the information is coming out, and I want to be clear: the Biden administration is working very hard, it, it looks like to a lot of us, um, to make sure this transition is as smooth as possible. Um, but again, the process of transferring millions of loan portfolios to, to another servicer, right, um, in a short amount of time, um, you know, for folks who want to do like auto pay, for example, and things like that, um, getting that communication, getting ready to pay that again, uh, in and of itself is already pretty confusing. But then you also have this piece where, you know, honestly, these pauses have provided a lot of critical relief for individuals, yeah. right? There's a, a lot of reporting on it. And so like, I'm happy to share um, um, in uh, kind of as the, as the piece comes out, there's a lot of reporting about how folks have said, you know, being able to save 100, 150, 200, $300 a month um, has allowed me to do X. Um, has given me like the peace of mind to uh, um, be able to buy food in this time where I've like lost my job, for example, um, or, uh, you know, pursue that like quality of life piece I've always been trying to pursue, right? So when you take a two year break from this, um, there are going to be complications on a technical, you know, on a technical level for sure. Um, but there are also kind of personal implications and, and complications as well there. Um, so that's something that I think we're really going to be paying close close attention to. Um, and of course, there is a contingent of folks in the higher education policy space um, who are now um, 
probably rightfully trying to take advantage of this moment to say, look, this is going to be a chaotic process. The better step would be canceling student debt, debt altogether um, or canceling a certain amount, um, whether it be 50,000 or 10,000, kind of depending on who's ad advocating um, uh, to, to support. Oh, and then sorry, one more critical piece that I want to add to this. Um, I know these answers are long, but one critical piece is um, this kind of all assumes, right, like a borrower is in good standing. Uh, a piece that I think the higher ed policy space talks about a little bit, um, but like the public doesn't really always engage with is how is this going to affect borrowers, right, that are, um, that are in default um, or that are otherwise delinquent on paying their loans. That's already a big piece of this for which, um, you know, these conversations occupy a lot of our discussions in, in the policy space. So, um, you know, there is a, a, a video recently, a news video, you can check it out, where EJ does kind of break down um, reporting from Politico and the Washington Post on the uh, Biden administration's plan to, to kind of restart repayment. Um, it looks like they're thinking about that, but, you know, that's another critical piece that um, we're really watching out for. Yeah, what... Um Give me uh, the the everyone's always curious about the 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 cancel student debt piece. You said the yeah. fifty thousand, the ten thousand. What's what's your kind of uh, as a someone who's an advocacy uh, or what do you see as where that kind of potential is today? Yeah, happy to share. So <clears throat> again, there's not been a moment like this for this conversation really ever, right? Um, you know, tens and tens of years ago, um, we, it was a very much a policy decision, right? Um, kind of slowly began to take the burden of paying for higher education and transition it from the collective and from the wealthy and from a, um, taxes and state investments and et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, slowly over time to the individual and the vulnerable, right? Um, and one of my favorite uh, writers, uh, the, she's a sociologist, um, Dr. Tracy McMillan Cottom describes this really well, right? In the context of, again, um, you have a country for which the promise of opportunity is largely connected to this idea of going to pursue a higher education. And it creates almost this education gospel, right? That's like, if you just but go and get that education after high school, you're going to have a better chance of being successful, being financially stable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as we have that, Right. We also have um, economic uh, recessions and economic volatility that mm -hmm. force states to divest in higher education in lieu of other programs. Um, we have um, at the federal government level um, critical programs like the Pell Grant um, staying around the same price as tuition and fees and housing um, and food and all the things associated with the cost of attendance continue to rise. Yeah. So the purchasing power of the Pell Grant and other critical programs is falling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you take those things combined, you have a situation where in pursuit of higher education um, that we already kind of like as a country, we're very much like independent, um, very much like K through 12, when a student fails, what's the school doing? But in higher education, if a student drops out, oh, it's the student's fault. That student yeah. took out, you know, too many loans, et cetera, et cetera. So we already kind of have this like element around higher ed as well. Um, then you add to that <clears throat> for many people, right? This like to, to attain that, they have to take on more risk um, in the form of different loan options, um, less, um, uh, less uh, lower quality schools, like uh, what Trust McMillan call, call, uh, calls lower ed, or for-profit institutions, et cetera, et cetera, schools that may not give them the boost that they're looking for. They have to take on more debt um, uh, and they have to take on more risk associated with paying back that debt and graduating yeah. um, to kind of match, right? So we definitely have this transition where um, a lot, again, the burden is on individuals taking out student loan debt to finish higher ed. And I think the student debt conversation should be about, right? Needs to be about, isn't always, but needs to be about um, two groups of people and one kind of thought and ideology. Um, starting with the ide ideology piece, um, again, we didn't know what the consequences were going to be, right? When we made this transition to like direct loan. So we made this transition to um, kind of debt, uh, debt financing, higher education. 
And it's been catastrophic, um, especially for certain groups. Well, there's a lot of reporting out there about people with massive amounts of student loans and um, you know, they still even owe their institutions um, who are foregoing having kids, foregoing buying a house, et cetera, et cetera, because they're afraid um, of the, the, how their debt will cripple them or inhibit those processes, right? Um, we know that for Black uh, students, excuse me, and Latino students, um, the numbers are worse, right, around default. Black students are twice as likely to default on their student loans, um, a Brook Brookings study finds, um, than their white peers. Um, and they're more likely black graduates are more likely to default on their loans yeah. over the course of 12 years than even the white peers who didn't graduate college, right? Yeah. Um, you know, critical pieces around people who incur all this debt, but higher education is not fit to serve them. So they stop out, right? Um, you have this kind of thing where it's like, we've made a mistake, right? <laughs> around making this move. And the kind of cancel student debt movement uh, is mostly focused on how we should rectify that mistake um, and the impact it's had on millions of Americans, right? Um, we also kind of think about canceling student debt through the piece of those who are in default. And this is kind of like an economic piece as well, right? Um, a lot of folks who are in default have small balances, uh, under $10,000 um, uh, um, of, 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 of student loan debt, um, education loan debt. Um, are not paying those back, not because they don't want to, uh, not because they're upset even about like what the quality of that higher education they received respected to their jobs and outcomes, but because they can't, right? So you already have a situation where for many of the loans that are in default, um, the Department of Education is paying servicers to try to collect that debt. Um, and that debt for all intents and purposes is uncollectible, right? Barring like a significant change in circumstances of, of these individuals, right? Um, so there's also a, an economic piece to it. That's mm. like, why continue to pay, um, you know, for expensive debt we can't collect on that we probably will not collect when instead there's an argument to cancel student debt, right? Yeah. Um, so to quickly kind of go through the plans, there are folks who believe that we should cancel all student debt. Um, I like to think um, that that's connected to this idea of like, we goofed, we goofed big, um, on, on, <laughs> on how we decided to fund and like, let's start this process over, including ways to make college less uh, or more affordable, I'm sorry. Um, you know, the, there was the Elizabeth Warren plan <clears throat> of canceling $50,000 of student debt. Um, and I know that was predicated on the fact that for most people, $50,000 of student debt, it makes up their entire balance, right? Yeah. Especially in including people who are in default and struggling to pay back their loans. Um, and people who are having a hard time making monthly payments, accurate monthly payments on their loans. Um, so that's proof of peace as well. I saw a lot of uh, kind of uh, purchase during the election. Um, and then with the pandemic, there was a surge of like, look, pausing the payments is working so well for folks and helping kind of keep folks afloat in this difficult time that maybe we should consider canceling, canceling $10,000 worth of student debt. Um, and this is something that actually you can still go to the uh, Biden campaign website today and see that, you know, even President Biden was in favor of doing this, right, um, at a time. You know, where that's at now, we, we have yet to see. Um, you know, a lot of us are trying to figure it out, <laughs> writing letters to try to get the uh, memo that was written by the department on, can on, on the department's authority to cancel student debt. Um, but finally, that's also a critical piece of it, right, um, is that there is reason to believe, and in fact now, in many ways, legal precedent, um, that the Department of Education, the Biden administration, any president um, with the authority vested in them by the Higher Education Act actually may have the power to cancel student debt by executive action with the stroke of a pen, is what we always say, right? Um, whereas there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not something like this could be successful in Congress with a congressional vote in the House and the Senate and canceling student debt. Um, recently, it's been challenged in a lot of legal scholars. We debate this to this day um, that, you know, actually the president has the power to cancel it. And um, we kind of, again, have seen some precedents for this, right? Um, the CARES Act in 2020 um, put a payment on a uh, payment pause on student loans. But each month of non-payment still counted towards programs like public service loan forgiveness, still counted towards income-driven repayment plans, right? Um, 
Congress did enact the CARES Act, but two times actually uh, did the Trump administration extend um, that extend that relief from the CARES Act, right? So there's those who would make the argument that there's precedence there too. Um, and that kind of in a nutshell, right, is, is kind of the debate, um, uh, or at least the viewpoint of folks who are in favor of canceling student debt. Yeah, um, I feel like today people are getting a class on on why uh, canceling student debt is is a viable option. And if they don't have student uh, loans, you are able to connect it in a way um, that I think allows it to connect to the economy, which is also important to them. Um, my last kind of my last kind of question for for uh, this time is around uh, the grace per- period that they mentioned when February first hits. Um, mm-hmm. To me, it's it felt reading the political article and just kind of looking to it that it seems very. Um, you know, not an extension, but a but a but a a, a flexible period where there's a lot of grace um, and um, uh, attentionality on getting people ramped up to paying their loans back. What was your take on the grace period, and do you have any insight on where it's at today? Yeah, so you know, not being a you know at the Department of Education, I can't speak specifically to the thoughts of um, you know Rich Corduroy there and other folks in federal student aid on on the thoughts there. But I can say, um, just as kind of speculation, um, again, like we know that uh, the circumstances that we discussed earlier, we know, and even if servicers were still signing back on, it would still be um, a pretty uh, chaotic, confusing process for people to restart paying their student loans after 20 months of not doing that. Um, Just as an example, take into consideration the fact that many people graduated college and have gone through their um, their kind of like predetermined um, forgiveness in the course of the pandemic, right? Over that 20 months. So that's plenty of time to have graduated college in what's the year, May, month, people, May of 2020, <laughs> right? And have gone through your natural like six months forgiveness until you, or sorry, not forgiveness, um, six months uh, grace period until you can start repaying. Um, so there are multiple people to think about in this case, right? People who are in yeah. school um, and looking to do deferment for a number of things, people who are grad, uh, who've graduated and are now, you know, for the first time ever <laughs> going to repay student loans, there's gonna yeah. be a lot of confusion. And I would suspect that the Department of Education um, in, the, um, in the thinking, the reporting on like this grace period is trying to take into consideration that like servicers, a lot of whom have a history of not necessarily getting these things right, mm-hmm. um, will need additional support, uh, even department staff, right? Will we'll, we'll, we'll need to think through and need additional supports for how to support uh, people who have student loans um, in repaying them. And then of course, like there's also communication. Um, it's hard to communicate with 40 million people, yeah. <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine, yeah. even if you contract that out, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think the department's trying to build in um, a grace period, not just for borrowers, but also for itself and also for new servicers, right? Mm-hmm. To get situated um, after 20 months of non-payment. And some of these servicers, again, also will be like dealing with way more student loans yeah. um, in their portfolio than ever before. So I think it's a corrective in that way and hence the flexibility. And I actually think it's really smart um, if, if that's the intention to do it that way, um, because, you know, it's going to be a lot. It's yeah. going to be a lot. Yeah. Well, Ernest, thank you so much for joining Ed News and uh, looking forward to you, seeing you. updates. I'm sure we'd love to have you back as we continue to see updates in this space. Uh, an important piece, like you said, for tens of millions of Americans. So thank you for joining Ed News. Absolutely. Always happy to connect. Uh, thank you for having me.